is Ralph from Happy Dog Training and welcome to another episode of Dog Talk. Today is another interview episode. I'm talking with biologist Carl Person, whose company Anomalia Herpetofauna is one of the top rattlesnake avoidance training companies in California and currently also branching out into Texas and uh, the East Coast. So very successful and very effective. The way Carl does rattlesnake avoidance training is something you know you want to hear, something interesting for you to, to take a look at and explore. And we had a wide-ranging conversation. We went about all the different types of rattlesnakes, uh, Carl's background, obviously, and his bio biology background, how he got into the whole game. Then uh, the different types of rattlesnakes, as I said, a rattlesnake bites, what to do, what not to do, the venom the effect of the different types of venom and also the applications in the medical field, which are way broader than I was aware of. We're going to talk about um, what, how much time you have if something like that happens to you out on the trail, some things you can do and some things you shouldn't do if it happens to you. And then obviously rattlesnake vaccines, which is also an important topic, and rattlesnake avoidance training. We're going to briefly touch on the lunacy of reinforcement only based rattlesnake avoidance training. I would not trust the life of my dog with that. And Carl has some interesting stories around this. But then we're talking about real rattlesnake avoidance training and how we actually make that reliable. And Carl has trained all my dogs for over 10 years. I've taken my personal dogs to him for rattlesnake avoidance training and I've seen how reliable and how um, how, yeah, how sophisticated the training process that Carl and his team go through is. So it's the only company I recommend here in California. It's the it company I send everybody to. And there's several articles on my website, which we're going to put in the show notes. And also, he's on my newsletter once or twice a year. Because it's, uh, it's important to get your, your dogs protected against rattlesnake bites by teaching them to stay away from them. So, without further ado, my conversation with Carl Person. Hi, um, glad to be here. Um, thanks for inviting me, and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it's going to be a great conversation. So, tell us about uh, your company and how you train rattlesnakes and how you got into it. <clears throat> okay, well, Animalia herpetofauna was originally developed because I do a lot of reptile shows all over the country. So, I was working for a lady. I met her... Um, just brief background, I had never had a dog in my life, okay? But I've had reptiles, especially rattlesnakes, forever. And so she wanted to do a rattlesnake avoidance training on Santa Catalina Island, but the biologist there would not allow her to bring mainland snakes onto the island. And so I had permits for some that I had collected on the island at Loma Linda University. And so she called me up to see if I would do it. And I thought, oh, you know, why not make a quick 300 bucks? What? Okay. So I went over there and I watched it. And I was thinking to myself, while I was watching it. I was thinking, this can't work. No way. This is not working. I can't. So anyways, I did that. And I didn't hear from her for quite a while. The following March, she calls me up or April. I can't remember exactly. And says, hey, you know, the guy that was doing my snakes quit. Do you think you can help me and bring someone with you? So Jared, my friend at the lab, and I went down there, and we worked at a golf course with her. And, you know, when it was all said and done, we kind of were both in agreement, like, come on, that, that, that just couldn't have worked. There's no way. Uh, one thing that she was doing was using old shed skins. Well, when a snake sheds, within a few hours, most of the aromatic molecules are gone. So basically, you have keratin laying there. OK, there'll be a little bit of snake smell, but it wanes as time goes on. And these skins were probably two years old because they're all like broken up, rotted. And the other thing she did was she'd have a little fan and have uh, a snake behind it to blow scent for her scent station, which was kind of weird. And then, of course, she concentrated on the sound. And so after helping her out for a while, I said to her, I said, you know, <laughs> I think we can design a lot better course because, you know, uh, I, I just don't think we're tapping into their vomeral nasal system. And when I said that to her, she didn't know what it was. And I realized now she was a great dog trainer. Don't get me wrong. She 
train them to ring a bell to go outside or all kinds of crazy stuff, stop at the curb, you know, everything. And they were very successful with that. But when it came to this, this is more of a physiological thing that you're looking for. And then I realized most dog trainers probably don't know what a vomeronasal system is or how it works. And basically what goes on is your dog breathes in through the front, exhales through a minute fraction will go right to the olfactory nerve. So if they like something or dislike something, they'll know right away. And so when they breathe out, they breathe out through those side slits, creates turbulence, and then they do a straight up and down lick. Now they have direction, identification, time. They can tell whether it was here an hour ago or it's here right now. Um, they get all of this information instantaneously with that. And the Jacobson's organs, two fluid filled cavities on the roof of their mouth goes right to the brain. It's the most effective part. And everything in a dog's world comes through their nose. So we couldn't understand why are we concentrating on this other stuff. There's another problem with the sound. Rattlesnakes, like most venomous snakes or snakes in general, will freeze when you approach them. Not start rattling right away, but freeze, hoping you will walk by and leave them alone, not even notice them. We call that procrypsis. And so the sound really doesn't mean that much. And sight. Well, if the dog's running through a field, by the time they see it and hear it, they probably stepped on it and already got bit. So what you want to do is tap into that vulnerable nasal system and you want to build distance. So that's the course that we started to develop and we've improved it ever since. And it's very, very effective. And in fact, most dogs that we get that have done this before, with a, two exceptions, most of the dogs that we've done this that have done it with other uh, people, they don't detect the scent station. Some of them don't even detect the snake. With ours, you do it twice, you're good for life. Yeah. So that's that, kind of how uh, I got into it. It was an accident. Yeah. Well, that, that's how the best things happen sometimes, you know? But so it's my personal personal anecdote. I mean, you've trained all of my dogs over the years for like, I've been known you for like 10 years now or longer, right? So we, we train a lot of my dogs. And one of uh, them was Nubia, uh, who I still have, when I had her out. And you, I mean, you demonstrated at the end, there's a snake lying in the grass, like this tiny little snake and it's muzzled and my dog walked around or ran around, didn't, didn't approach it. So like, yeah, it worked. But then when your, um, when your assistant, oh, your son, I forgot, I forgot who it was, but it picked up the snake and put it in this container with some sand where it was in. And in this process, spilled a little bit of sand on the grass in that area where it was um, actually not where it, where it was lying, but like on the back out, oh, it spilled a bit of sand. And then I know we went in and we talked a little bit. I had Nubia on a leash. We walked out and I just walked like past this. She would have walked straight over the sand where the snake had lay in and she wouldn't do it. She's like, no, 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 no. I'm not going near this sand. Where and it was just the sand there, like the sand grains. Well, like the snake was previously, and she still picked up on it. So, one hundred percent works. I've, I've seen it with all my dogs, and this and, new, new and the trick to that is, is that as you know, we do five to seven scent stations. Yeah. Each one of those has less, and it's more and more sand, less and less substrate from the cage. Yeah. So we're building distance at the same time, and then yeah. the baby at the end, the dog can't see that thing. And yep. so when they stop and do that lick, you know, you got them. And so the following year, we always do it in reverse. We do the, we'll do the uh, scent first, then the baby, and that's it. And usually we have one guy had a Basinji, which is actually a land race mm -hmm. uh, rather than a breed. And he brought it back the third time. I told him, I said, you don't need to. He couldn't get the dog out of the car. And I told him, I, I said, you know, you spent that money for, he goes, no, it was worth the money to see that. Oh, yeah. yeah. So what was actually was when you first time you told me the story, what was surprising to me is that not everybody trains it through scent because we train so much through scent. We do service dogs here and a lot of that <gasps> stuff is scent, blood pressure, heart rate, uh, blood sugar, whatever, even, even seizure stuff is trained through scent. Um, I've taken cancer, how to detect cancer, um, because you can't identify, you can't isolate the scent. So that's kind of interesting. You have to train differentials. That's done through scent and excellent breath condensate. 
obviously police, military application, drugs and explosives and all that stuff is done for sin. So a lot of the, and tracking and sport, right? So a lot of the really cool stuff is done through scent and dogs' noses are just incredible. So I'm, yeah. I was surprised that it was not the standard thing that, that you are kind of unique in the way around here anyways, that who does it this way, you would expect everybody to work that way, but clearly not. So that- No, that, what that's your the, part. Standard, the standard is they introduce the dog to a big snake then a scent station, then a sound station, and then they do a recall. They'll have the snake in between you and the, uh, between the dog and the person and call the yeah. dog. Well, we do the recall too. The only difference is, is the dog can't see the snake because it's so small. You know, yeah. We don't care if it sees it. We don't care if it hears it. We want the dog to pick up from about 10 feet. So the first year we usually get four or five feet. The second year, we usually achieve our goal of 10. Yeah. yeah but we're not, not going to go into who this other trainer was, for just for so many reasons. But I know who it is. And I went there later after you had stopped working with her. Because a client of mine wanted had actually hired her independently for some rental right. Just for that. And she was afraid of snakes herself. So she asked me to come with her. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll handle your dog. And I saw... What, what was going on there and the dog just ran straight over the snake at the end it's like we had to do this again and he ran over the snake twice in a row like okay it's not doesn't look like he's picking up on that so i, I i've seen the after after you left um how, to, how that uh, continued and, uh, yeah and the oh. this whole issue is is that she learned it from you know and People learn it from each other, but they've learned it wrong. They're not thinking about what's going on. And like you brought up, I mean, the whole dog's world comes through his nose, you know. So what are they doing? <laughs> and this is just like a quick reference for everybody who wants to learn more. There is a wonderful TED Talk from Andrea Horowitz. Alexandra, sorry. Alexandra Horowitz. It's a TED Talk. It's on YouTube. And she made this animation, this really cool video about how a dog's nose works and how powerful it is and tons of examples. So it's really cute, cute animation to watch. It's very educational in terms of understanding just the power of, of scent for a dog better. It's just incredible what they can do. Um, scent wise. So yeah, absolutely. Cool. So um, let's talk about uh, rattlesnakes more in general. So what kind of rattlesnakes do we have crawling around here in, the, in California and then in the rest of the United States? And what are the different toxins yeah. we're dealing with? So uh, for rattlesnakes and for people back east in, in the central part, you have copperheads, cottonmouths, and coral snakes. Coral mm -hmm. snakes, you'd really have to work at it to get bit by. So no one trains for that. But so for rattlesnakes in Southern California, you have six species. You have the Southern Pacific. You have the um, red diamond, the southwestern speckled. Panamint rattlesnake, Sidewinder, Mojave. <clears throat> and then a little farther north, <clears throat> you have the uh, Northern Pacific up in like north of uh, Ventura. So their venoms vary tremendously. And it's the same throughout the United States. Uh, if you're in the Eastern United States, you'll have the canebrake timber rattlesnake thing. Well, the ones in... Um, Carolinas and North Florida have a powerful neurotoxins. The ones in central Georgia have a really weak venom. So it, rattlesnake venom is really variable. In Southern California, the most medically significant is the Southern Pacific. Because just like the cane break that I mentioned, depending on where you are, <clears throat> they have very different venom. Yeah. On top of San, uh, Mount San Jacinto, you have a powerful neurotoxin. In mm -hmm. Phelan area, you have a thing that causes micro blood clots that they have to deal with. You know, so it just varies from place to place. So fortunately, the anti-venoms we have, there's two of them, um, Crofab and Anti-Vitmin. They work on all North American pit vipers. So fortunately, we're in good shape with that. Um, so both of them work on all bites. Yes. Um, now, if you're bitten by a neurotoxic snake like a Mojave or a, a midget faded rattlesnake or one of the cane breaks, 
Crofab is the way to fly. It's really effective on neurotoxin. If you get bitten by some of the others that are more uh, hemorrhagic, you're better off with antivitamin. And the reason is the molecules are bigger, so it stays in the blood longer. The problem with Crofab is it, it, some of it gets lost in your muscle tissue and stuff, and it takes a tremendous amount of it, but not on the neurotoxins. For whatever reason, it is super, super effective on that. So, you know, anywhere you are in the United States, you should just call 911 mm -hmm. if you get bitten. And, you know, you've read stuff about tourniquets, ice, cutting. The problem with all that stuff, it was written at, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and it all makes everything much worse. And a good example of that would be, say you get bitten on the hand and you make yeah. little cuts and you start trying to suck venom out. Mm -hmm. Well, most snakes have a thing that acts like a meat cleaver to chop your tissue up so the other molecules can get in and do their job. Mm -hmm. So uh, women use hyaluronic acid to tighten their skin. These guys have hyaluronidase, which cuts things up. And so you make those little cuts, you try and suck, you're probably only getting some of your own lymph tissue or something. Where, um, And then later, a few hours later, when your hands and arm are three times their normal size, black and blue, no blood flow, you have these big gaping holes, you end up inviting gangrene. So you could end up losing body parts. So yeah. unless you're allergic to the venom, which means you've either been bitten before or you work with them and developed an allergy. Because if you have no exposure, you can't be allergic. So you have plenty of time to get to the hospital. You get there as soon as you can, get the anti-venom, and you're good to go. So, so how long does a, does a human being have, like a, a regular-sized human? Well, you know, you, if yeah. it's a, like a, some of the powerful nerve toxins, Mm -hmm. those you have less time, but you're not going to die in 15 minutes or something. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? You could call yeah. 911 or get to the hospital and they'll get the antivenom to you and you're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, if it's one of the hemorrhagic type snakes, you have eight to 10 hours at least. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so yeah. how long was it again on the neurotoxin snake? You have like a couple of hours, two, three hours or something like yeah, that? Yeah, probably. Um, you know, like the Mojave mm -hmm. in California, the midget faded in Utah, and of course the cane breaks in North Florida and the Carolinas. Those, you know, those have very powerful nerve toxins. Mm -hmm. But um, so you, you need to get to the hospital fairly quick. But yeah. boy, that antivenom works on that like gold. So what about dogs? So how long do they have? I mean, obviously okay. it depends on the size of the dog, I guess, but like let's say a 50 pound dog, how long? Okay. Now most dogs, of course, are going to be bitten in the face because they put their nose in a hole or something like that. Yeah. The big issue with that is now dogs, keep in mind, their muscle is much denser than ours. Mm -hmm. And so that actually protects them. It gives them some extra time. The problem is they tend to get bit on the face. And even though they probably don't get much venom because they have a pretty bony nose and mm -hmm. the fangs aren't going through the bone. Um, but the problem is, it's the swelling. OK, yeah. so breathing could become an issue. Mm -hmm. Now, there's some vets that don't like it, but others do is uh, Benadryl. So mm -hmm. and they say one milligram per pound, I believe it is. Um, so you should always consult with your veterinarian, but Benadryl at least keep the swelling down so your dog can breathe. And that's usually the worst part of it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> as far as a 50 pound dog getting bit in the leg or something, you can carry him out and get him to the vet within a couple hours or so. He's going to be fine. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I heard, I heard Benadryl from uh, so many different angles. I heard it from vets. I heard it from other snake trainers I met over the years. I've, I've heard it from so many different people. So Benadryl works. It's, it's your yeah, experience. and it actually helps um, neutralize some parts of certain snake venoms, which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. There was a study out on that. That oh. was fairly recent. Yep. Yeah. So Benadryl is not a bad thing to have, you know. Uh, yeah. So, um, but I always tell people, you know, if you're going to do it, consult with your vet. Um, yeah. so, you know, don't take my advice for it. I'm not a veterinarian. 
<laughs> no, no, of course, you've always talked to your vet no matter what anybody says, but um, yeah, but that's their field, right? As long as it's not like nutritional training, <laughs> right? Right, but, yeah, medical stuff like that, and absolutely, but not for question, right? Um, right. Okay, well, that, that, that's good to know. So you, you mentioned before that there's also medical applications for the venom. So it's not just all bad and bad for us. There's actually things we can do with it that is good for us. So let's maybe talk right. about that for a moment. Doesn't apply to like you and I in everyday life, but it, it's certainly interesting. Well, so you'd be surprised. You'd be very surprised how many okay. people. So in okay. 1981, the first ever venom derived medicine came out it's called Captopril. It's used for congestive heart failure, diabetic kidney failure and hypertension has okay. been used since 1981 worldwide millions upon millions of people depend on that drug to stay alive it comes from the lancehead viper in south america oh, wow. and because venom is so complex they had to really figure out what exact part of the molecule is doing what exactly in the body mm. well because they had to be so specific it revolutionized the way all pharmaceuticals are made to this day. So they're a little bit safer now because they're more targeted and more specific. Millions of more lives saved indirectly. <clears throat> if you know someone that gets those uh, DVT blood clots in their legs, very painful, probably yeah. take an echostatin from the saw scale viper in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. um, worldwide, breast cancer has become epidemic. Well, it turns out that a part of the venom in the copperhead from the eastern United States prevents the cells from adhering to the body's matrix so the tumor dies. Pretty valuable. So once they get that refined, wow. So I just mentioned three out of hundreds. There's diagnostic tools that come from snake venoms for, you know, different ailments. There's mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff. So anytime you wipe something like this out, really, you're probably only hurting yourself. Do people die from snake bite each year? Yes. But the odds are in our favor, like millions and millions to one, just on one drug, let alone the hundreds. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. Very, seems very very oh, I had no idea. Huh. That's super interesting. I didn't know yeah. it was that. I think of maybe like, like <laughs> it's just in some drug development here and there, but that's pretty, some pretty, pretty major. Oh, no, they're. Uh, with the cobra, they're looking at an immunosuppressor for multiple sclerosis. Um, you have um, integralin is used for unstable angina. It's another heart condition. Integralin is from the pygmy rattlesnake in Florida. Um, so there's a blood clotting test that come from the uh, another lancehead viper in South America. There's just all kinds of stuff out there. And I did a study and was part of a study and we tested for um, brain injury reduction. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about brain injury, like surgery and stuff, one or 2% makes a huge difference because your brain's encased in your skull. So yeah. just 1% could be a real problem. Mm -hmm. Well, we used Southern Pacific venom and it worked. It reduced the swelling by about 2%. So um, that study is actually listed on my website. But right. so there's, <clears throat> there's a whole plethora of different studies on venom to medicine. And Very the more, good. yeah. So the more we learn about it, the, you know, the more we work with the different venoms, fractioning them up, seeing what they do, the more we get out of it. Yeah. And obviously, your website will be listed in the show notes, and any yeah. stuff you can dig up for related to what we're talking about. I'll also put them in the show notes as well for anyone who wants to read a little bit more. So, let's say you're out on a trail and it's going to be five hours away from your car with your dog, and one of you gets bitten by a rattlesnake. What's and you have no idea what it is at this point, you don't know what snake it is, um, what kind of toxin you probably have. People won't remember either. What's your best bet of survival at this point? For well, hopefully, hopefully you'll have a cell phone. You mm -hmm. know, uh, if you're a five-hour hike, that's long. But if it's a, if it's not a Mojave or a Southern Pacific or or a Mojave or a uh, midget faded or the canebrake, mm -hmm. you know, I'd start making my way out until I had cell signal. Right. You know, because. 
you got you can't just lay there. <laughs> yeah, obviously. So and then would you continue to walk or would you rather not the moment you have signal and just like have the helicopter lift you out? Or oh yeah, if you have cell phone signal, you're better off just to rest, stay still. Okay. Uh, because you don't want to add to it. Yeah. Don't want your metabolism to pump it through your whole body if you can avoid that. Yeah, okay. Exactly. Um same I now, assume if it's on your hand, you could hold your hand like a little above your heart and that'll wow. help. Okay, and I'm assuming it's the same for your dog. Um, if you can, carry them. If not, walk out slowly, call for help if possible. Same. Yeah, as soon as you can get that yeah. cell signal. And uh, Benadryl at that point? Um, yeah, well, Benadryl, because it's an antihistamine. So yeah. your body, venom will work kind of against you in two ways. First of all, all the constituents in venom, most of them are found naturally in your body. Mm -hmm. this, this is an overdose. OK, um, of course, they have little side chains that do different things that make it more toxic, obviously. But the yeah. other thing your body is going to do is it's going to throw histamines up there because the heat helps to you know, fight bacteria or whatever it happens to be. That's why you get that red swelling. It's histamines and stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> if you take an antihistamine, you're going to calm things down. So, you know, and if you have, like, if you get bitten on the hand, if you have any kind of jewelry, take it off immediately. Yeah. You know, because yeah. once you start to swell, it's not coming off and it could be a disaster. Yeah, it could, yeah, it could lose your finger or like that. Yeah, if you're wearing shoes, loosen your shoelaces so that you can yeah. get your foot out of your shoe. Mm -hmm. So I, I've seen pictures in the past um, where somebody was bitten by a uh, snake with hemotoxin and... Um, I mean, they tied it off or they try to, and then they just the venom ate away at the skin and was like all gone. So, how long does <clears> something <throat> it's like that take before you have like really lost your uh, usage of your arm has to be amputated? Um, what was the time frame to? Well, here's here's the deal with most of those hemorrhagic type venoms, you're gonna have swelling, you're gonna have necrosis, you know, rot. Um, you're gonna have that. Mm -hmm. And um, so the quicker you get that anti-venom, the less damage the venom is going to do. But you will have some um, some scars from it, for sure. It's not an if, it's a you will. And <clears throat> so, of course, the quicker you can get anti-venom, the less damage it does. And yes. in extreme cases, like an eastern diamondback or something in Florida that's, you know, four feet long, most mm -hmm. people there, when they get bitten, they ended up on dialysis because of a thing we call it rhabdomyolysis. What it is, is the venom is breaking down so much proteins and stuff, your liver and kidneys cannot keep up with it. Yeah. So, um, but yeah. hopefully oh, no, no, get, no, get the anti-venom as quick as possible and you'll be all right. <laughs> Well, I don't get bitten by rattlesnake. So which brings us to rattlesnake vaccines and avoidance training in comparison. But let's start with the vaccines, then we go into training. Obviously, that's what you do. Yeah, and this oh. is a good place to put the vaccine talk in. So now there are studies out there that show that it's not very effective. But I want to tell you something about vaccines. OK, let's back this up a minute. If rattlesnake vaccines or venomous snake vaccines could be made, we would have had them for humans a long time ago, okay? Uh, the way that you have to make antivenom is you are constantly injecting small amounts into the sheep if it's in New Zealand or horses in Central America or wherever you happen to be doing. So you have equine or bovine, either one. Um, so anyways, um, you constantly keep injecting the venom, constant, to keep the immunity up. If you stop, then that immunity drops off and then they can't get the immunoglobins out of the sheep or whatever they're using. So the idea of giving your dog one of these vaccines and then maybe going back 30 days later for a booster and then not doing it again until the next year. Well, the study showed that it was originally developed for horses, by the way, but the study shows that one third of the horses had no clinical response to it. It was worthless. Yeah. One third, it was after 30 days, nothing. And the other third, maybe a few weeks lo longer. I, I can't remember the exact. But 
In other words, it's not going to happen. But yeah. there is one bad side effect that can happen. And so a lot of vets have stopped giving it. They mm. can, when you inject that venom, even though it's denatured, it, could, it still sometimes causes a granuloma. And it mm. can get infected and bad things can happen. I've had clients tell me that they got it for one of their dogs one time. And the dog ended up really messed up and ended up dying. So, you know, were there complicating factors? I, I'm not sure. But um, rattlesnake avoidance training, you're using the, that your dog's natural abilities to stay out of danger and to warn you. Mm -hmm. right you start yeah, to see yeah. that behavior you're going to be like whoa what's going on mm -hmm. yeah but, but, but let's circle back one more time i think what you said in the very beginning of the vaccine i think that is probably the most important thing to just keep in mind if that actually worked we would have them for humans and we, we would, would have it worldwide and we would give it to everybody who is in areas like here in southern california places where these rattlesnakes crawling everywhere so if it yeah. wasn't thing that was working, we would give it to ourselves. That's all it's exactly. But you know, that's that's the key. And that's what I always bring up to people. And on my site, there's a little thing and I cite the two studies that were done. And you know, you can make up your own mind. In Southern California, you have the Southern Pacific rattlesnakes. Well, yep. the vaccines made only with Western diamondback rattlesnake venom. Mm -hmm. So even if it was to work a little bit. A lot of people say, oh, give me extra time. No, it won't. Um, even if it was, it would only be for that. It's not going to help with the Mojave. It's not going to help with the cane break. It's not going to help with anything. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and that yeah. effect, you can literally get the Benadryl. So if it's not really um, serve, serve as, as helping the purpose of what you're like after, like buy more time, right? Um, yeah. But actually, so this particular thing, so there is three articles, just a, a side note, I guess. We're going to put this actually on all of these because we're touching on all the different topics. But Carl has um, written three guest posts on Happy Dog Training, all about rattlesnakes, uh, some of the rattlesnakes vaccines, some comparing vaccines to avoidance training and the rattlesnake poisons and uh, toxins and so forth. So all the things we're touching in this podcast on this guest post from Carl, and all of the, this specific thing he just mentioned is also in there. So we're going to put this podcast um, together with those articles um, because it just like all fits together nicely. But yeah, I've, I've, read, I've read this before. I did uh, the the um, the vaccines are not made for the most commonly encountered rattlesnake to begin with. So it's, yeah, it's yeah, and so not really going to do the job. It okay. just it to me the risk does not outweigh the possible reward, which is almost nothing. Yeah, if it was protective, it would be one thing, but it's really barely doing anything, and what it does is not. It can, can be achieved cheaper and, and safer and doesn't do much. Yeah. So let's talk about avoidance training because that is the answer um, because it makes um, it makes your dog a warning system for you and protects your dog from getting bitten, right? So let's talk about that and the way you go about it. And uh, you touched on the, on the descent approach you're taking, but let's just dive into this a little bit more. And yeah, let me, <clears throat> I'll flesh it out a little bit here. Yeah. So if your dog has never been to rattlesnake avoidance training, completely naive, we yep. introduce them to a large, usually kind of grumpy rattlesnake. And most dogs will walk up and put their face right into it. And so we do use the shock collar. We do keep it as low as we possibly can, but we give them that and the stimulus of the snake and the shock is enough. Um, yep. On real sensitive dogs, we just use the pager, the vibrate and it works. So it just mm -hmm. depends on the breed. <clears throat> the next thing we do is we go through several scent stations. And the first one is pretty potent, okay? Yep. Because we want them to pick up right away. Mm -hmm. But each successive station gets more and more sand, less and less substrate. The reason yep. is, is because we want to not only have them in tune with it, we're trying to build distance at, at the same time. So obviously the farther away you are from the snake, the less odor there's gonna be. Our ultimate goal is the first year to get them at least five feet and then second year, hopefully 10. Mm -hmm. So after we've done the scent stations, <clears throat> we have a baby rattlesnake. I know the dog cannot see that. So we want them to use their Jacobson's organ that we talked about mm -hmm. to find that. They don't need to see it. And the crucial reason that we do this, 
is if your dog is running through the field, as I already said, rattlesnakes will freeze. They're not going to be rattling or something. Your dog comes plowing through the field, especially hunting dogs. Yeah. By the time they see and hear it, they've already gotten bitten. So you have a lot of these trainers out there. They they, they want a couple sound stations and they'll have one scent station. One lady has a stuffed baby rattlesnake at the end. What is that? Um, <laughs> and then, you know, all, all this nonsense. But it, the problem is, is that if you do not tap into that bumeral nasal system, you've got nothing. So we've had people that I, I remember one lady and sp specifically, I felt so bad for. So she had done this dog training with another company and five years in a row and paid okay. a substantial amount for it, much more than we were charging. And so my son was walking the dog towards our first scent station, which is really potent. So if the dog had caught on from this other five years of training, mm -hmm. it would not have gone near that, but it put its nose right in it. And of course I had to zap it right away, um, which just stunned me. So I yeah, said to yeah. Zach, my son, I said, why don't you, Take it over there, see if it'll put its face right in the rattlesnake. Uh, I couldn't believe it. The lady, of course, was flaming hot, and I don't blame her. So we yeah, had to yeah. just redo the whole thing. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, it's just, and it's sad because when you pay out that much money every year after year after year, with ours, you do it twice, you're not getting them out of the car the third time. You yeah. know, it's not going to happen. And yeah. so, the only reason that that could be is we're tapping into the physiology of both the snake and the dog. We know what, I know what's going on with the snake in the wild. I know how they're going to act. Mm -hmm. I also studied up on the dogs and, you know, we got it down pretty good. We've had no one that we've done has taken their dog out somewhere and got bit that I'm aware of anyway. Yeah. So. No, I, I believe it from my, just from my experience. That's what we're talking because I know, I know, how reliable that is just based on what I've seen in my own dog. So, um, yeah. And I get that a lot from a lot of dog trainers, veterinarians and stuff there. They don't tend to, they stop sending them to other people because yeah, they yeah. know mine works, but that yeah. the others aren't quite to par. We'll put it. I, I personally, I don't do rattlesnake training myself. I send everybody to you. Uh, um, yeah. And uh, you're my newsletter once or twice a year. So, it's it's just the way to go. Anybody who wants to rattlesnake avoidance training, I send them right to your website. Um, so let's 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 tap let's uh, um, add a little bit to that. So you're using shock collars. So I'm just gonna put my dog trainer hat on here for a moment. I know some people are they don't like shock collars, but that's the point. Your dog doesn't like it either, and that's the whole concept. We're teaching the dog approaching that thing that smells like this little in the ground that is a bad idea don't do that and we're teaching him that'll hurt you out getting bitten by a rattlesnake and dying on the trail so exactly. that's the application there if anybody objects to that they have to like answer have some questions to answer in my mind because it's protecting the dog's lives i mean this is not this is what it's about it's about teaching that dog don't approach something that would literally kill you so yeah and you don't have to get you don't have to get crazy with it. No, uh, a lot of the people that do this rattlesnake training, they they want to see the dog do a backflip. Yeah, that's so garbage. That's total yeah. garbage. I want as little shock as possible because I want him to keep learning. If I shock him too hard, he might shut down, and I'll get nothing out of it. You know. Yeah. So yeah. you gotta you gotta use your brain with this. And then of course you and I discussed um, amusingly. Uh, this positive reinforcement rattlesnake avoidance training. Yeah, let's, uh, yeah. share your thoughts on that. I mean, yeah, so let me just like prime this a little bit because not everybody has probably seen this. But this pops up quite regularly now. It's become more more frequent, I guess. Um, and it's usually these uh, Australian shepherds or border collies in this yard. And there's this gigantic snake lying somewhere on a ledge and the dogs are not approaching it. And see, look, positive reinforcement rattlesnake avoidance training. So... I mean, first of all, reinforcement and avoidance are not words that really go together well. So teaching a dog to avoid something by reinforcing something around that is probably not the way to go. You want them to actually not approach this. But just because you see a couple of dogs maybe not approaching something doesn't prove that that was a valid approach to training any dog out there and create reliability in a large dog population. 
Right. So I risk my dog's safety to whatever that approach was. I want my dog to learn. Don't approach that. That's a bad idea. That's a better teaching philosophy when it comes to things that will actually kill you. So, and that's and what that's about, right? So, as you brought out, it's mostly border collies and Australian yeah. shepherds. Guess what? They're also my best clients because yeah. a border collie is considered the perfect mix between wolf instinct and dog learning. Mm. And the Australian shepherds, number two. And so, here you have the best dogs in the world. And because most of them probably do agility training or whatever they're doing with them. Right. They're, they're used to that positive reward, maybe the ball or whatever. Um, but here's the problem. OK, a border collie and an Australian shepherd, they see that big snake in the middle of the field and you say, no. Well, of course, they're not going to go near it anyway. Uh, I find that border collies right away, the first time they see a snake and they're just like, whoa, 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 <laughs> you know. So, I mean, I could do them in a bathtub and they'd be successful. You know what I'm saying? So that's not a real good test. So I challenge someone that does that in Southern California. I said, I'll tell you what, you bring your dog onto my course. And if it passes, I'll pay you. That's a lot. Guess what they didn't, guess what they did not do. They didn't bring the dog because they know better. This is nonsense. Um, And then I had another guy, he came up. He says, well, I do positive reinforcement. I just want to be able to walk through your course and do this. Well, this course, first of all, is if you don't know what you're looking for, you will fail at it. You will not train the dogs right. You have to actually know what you're looking for in the dog's physiology. So he's doing stuff and giving them treats for this and that. And I, okay, but I, I guarantee you that dog got nothing out of it. Maybe that it'll get a treat if it finds a rattlesnake. It might have got that out of it. But, you know, it's, it's just. You know, and I've talked to even several vets, you know, I thought, well, what do you think of this? And they all break up laughing. They said, it's so stupid. You're training your dog to find them. And then yeah. you give them a treat. I mean, are you kidding me? You want to, and you brought it out. You know, mm-hmm. uh, avoidance is the opposite <laughs> of <laughs> the uh, positive reinforcement, you know? So they're completely different. Um, and so when I'm training, I don't want the dog to go near that. I want them to back off, you know, and sooner rather than later, you know? So I don't say good boy. You know, at the end, after the course is over, we do, you know, you give them some affection and stuff because it's stressful course, you know, but, uh, but the shock collar to me is the only real way to do it. I, I have seen some videos on this positive reinforcement for rattlesnake avoids. I just look at it and laugh. Come on. Yeah, it's it's fundamentally flawed in its whole approach. I mean, I have have podcasts and people have probably listened to this. If they get to this, there's a reinforcement podcast, there's a punishment podcast, there's all kinds of um, things. And the approach that in the the forcefree community is usually taken with this kind of stuff is the differential reinforcement route. And differential reinforcement has its time and place. And there's wonderful things you can do with that. But rattlesnake avoidance training isn't it. So when, when you reinforce, anything reinforcement is about teaching the dog to do something, whatever it is. But yeah. reinforcement is about encouraging behavior and doing things. While punishment is about discouraging behavior and not doing things. So teaching a dog not to do something needs to be done in a way that produces a safe outcome. Don't chase that car. Don't chase that motorcycle. Don't pursue that rattlesnake. Don't chase that mountain lion. But whatever. <laughs> so it's like right. it's doing some, not doing something that keeps you alive. You just have to take the route that will result in a reliable outcome to that end, um, no matter what your personal preferences may be. Nobody wants to go and shock dogs with, with shock dogs. Nobody really enjoys doing that. That's not the no. Point is, we need to you not get bitten by a rattlesnake, stay alive and not die. That's the point, and that's exactly. the fact. That goal and that 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 has even a debate. Find I find personally a little disturbing because it's life and death. It shouldn't, shouldn't be, but apparently it is. Um, all right, let's move on from that. So the um, the approach that you're taking is obviously create an avoidance response and. 
I personally seen so like when we first took, I forgot that was so long ago. I think the first time I've seen you do it, that that shot caller was actually at a level two or four, and it wasn't one that had ten levels, one with a hundred levels, <laughs> and uh, your your team had it like four or something, like super super low. Like I couldn't even feel this, but the dog will. I said it was enough to accomplish the outcome. And with some dogs, it's going to be higher. And with some dogs, it's going to be lower. But it's not about, as you said, about the dog just making backflips and flipping out and losing its shit. It's it's about, well, now we have to market explicit, I guess. <laughs> um, it's like losing its mind. And um, it's about just teaching the dog to avoid this thing because it's an unpleasant thing to approach. And that's what you're doing. That's simply it. And there are a lot of people that do the rattlesnake avoidance training. They turn it up to darn high. So the dog is so stressed out. Did he really learn anything? Yeah. You know, the lower you can keep it, the more effective your training is going to be. Now, there are breeds where you do have to turn it up. Huskies, for obvious reasons, they're working dogs. They have a thick neck with lots of, you know, um, so you have to turn a little higher. But, you know, most dogs, we do police dogs. Two and a half is a hard correction or 25, depending on your brand, what brand you're using. Well, if that's a hard correction on a police dog, well, uh, why am I going to hit a poodle with 50? It doesn't make sense. You know, it's just, you know, there's a lot of nonsense. I think it's maybe human mortality, more helps more, right? This is great. Let's go higher. Works even better. And that's not even good. So just the studies on this kind of stuff in terms of intensity, they'll tell you the exact opposite, just like you. Well, once the dog knows this could be here, ah, lower is just fine. You don't have to keep going up. That's that's silly. That's really not smart for any type of physical um, aversive tool. No matter what, you don't want to keep going up at all. You just want the dog to learn stop. And, then... and a lot of times, like if you do border collies or something, after the first shot, you switch to vibrate and it does the same thing. Yeah. Which so, also it... makes perfect sense because once the dog knows it could be higher or lower, Usually doesn't make any difference. You use, I like to use the least amount yeah. of, you know, to because uh, I don't want the dog to freak out. I want it to learn. So. Exactly. You can't overload the system with too much stress. It's not helpful. Exactly. Cool. Good. So um, what else would you like to add about rattlesnake? I think we touched on all the things we had previously um, discussed. Well, what else did did we forget something or you want to add something that we haven't mentioned oh, yet? one thing i will do want yeah. to add is that after a rattlesnake avoidance training thing the best thing to do is take your dog home and mm-hmm. let it rest because it, it's a stressful course they'll go home they might take a nap and while mm-hmm. they're dreaming they're reinforcing the second thing is never take your dog up and point to a snake to see if it worked if anything you reinforce by pulling it away you know, yeah. most of most, our dogs, 90% of them, they're gone. You know, they don't want nothing to do with it. But in the case of some stubborn ones, you know, even if it's just a gopher snake still, just pull it away. So the dog, it reinforces. If you're afraid of it, he's going to say, oh, okay, yeah, I remember, yeah, I don't want this. You know, the, I, I have owners, well, can I, after they're all, all done the course, well, can I walk them through now? No, I don't have a shock collar on them, and you'll undo what I just did. Yeah, you know, so, you know, there's just a little bit of stuff like that. And um, another thing that I would add is that, you know, if you're out walking on a trail and you see a rattlesnake, you know, you take two steps back, walk around, you're good to go. They're not going to come after you. Yeah. Yeah, I personally encountered a couple. Um, I wasn't with my dogs at the time, but. Yeah, they'll leave you alone if you leave them alone and they don't, don't pose a threat. So don't step over them. I mean, like, like straight over them. Let's like go around them. But yeah. And I was on some people, narrow trails where there wasn't much room, but it still wasn't the problem. So. You know, most people bitten each year, either trying to catch them or kill them. You don't want to get bit, don't touch them. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you, you actually you touched on something that I think is generally not appreciated enough because we see this in training a lot. It's not just rattlesnake training related. Once a dog has gone through a lesson, let it be your lesson or any other lesson, even the things we teach and service dogs, whatever, you can go through a lesson and you can see a dog even having a hard time, maybe not picking up or you don't see him making progress in a session and it just like seems it's kind of stuck there. But then you stop, pause, 
come back the next day and the dog masters that task like a champion. He just had time to integrate these circuits into his head and just like become more fluent at it and think about it. And it's exactly how it is with us. So when, when we learn something, let's say you learn how to play the piano, you learn how to play a symphony, whatever, you have a hard time as a passage and you're like, I can't get over it, I can't get over it, I can't get over it. Yeah. It's like, oh. Next day you come, no problem. Right? So it's just like, sometimes your brain just, you know, sometimes often, your brain just needs a break. And it's like, sleep on it and come back to it and you will be surprised how this actually starts oh. and it's the same what you just outlined let the dog rest and then um. yeah well i'll tell you this happened this is true um uh, one time we we did a um rattlesnake avoidance training and we had this one dog that i didn't think did very well at all yeah well the yeah. following year we're up there and we're doing a tv spot and the dog that they bring is that one i thought oh this is gonna look good but actually the dog did fantastic. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, <clears throat> a lot of people will want you to, well, can you do it one more time? Can you do it one more time? No, you, you don't need that. You know, yeah. you go through the course, be done with it, take your dog home, let him rest, you know, yeah. or walk it off a little bit or whatever. Uh, and then he'll be fine. She will be fine, whatever. Um, so, you know, don't, there's no you know, there, you don't overdo anything, you know, it's just not good. Yeah. Um, you're putting them through stress. So all, the more you, right? All right. And if you push too hard, they're not going to learn. They're going to shut down Yeah. because they don't know what you want. They'll start, you'll see them. They'll start getting confused and, you know, they'll just, they're not getting anywhere further. You know, you're just, so if I see them stressing out, if it's halfway through the course, I'll give a free voucher because I'll stop. Mm -hmm. and say here just come to our next clinic and we'll finish it out yeah and that is so much more effective than trying to push them through yeah now you have to, you have to know when to stop and sometimes yeah you, you can't it. yeah you can't if you overdo it the dog learns nothing and then i think that's also i mean it's us we have our, we have these ideas of what we want to see and what we want to accomplish and think we can do more we need to respect what our dogs can do and every dog's different some dogs can power through and then for hours and hours, and then you do something really complicated and they can't think anymore after like 20 minutes. You're like, well, normally you can go longer. Yeah, but this is hard. So I, <laughs> this is, just gets me worn out. I can't, can't process it. Um, it's interesting that as a trainer, you bring up 20 minutes. That's where we've decided that's like the maximum we can do. Yeah. Around 20, maybe 25 minutes. After that, it goes right downhill. Yeah. But right, so this, I mean, the way dog trainers work varies widely. I mean, the, I think the most common thing is probably pull the dog out for five minutes, five times a day or some, three times a day or something like that. Um, that seems to be the most common approach. I don't take that approach personally. I work the dog until the dog shows me he's done and then we'll take a break and then we'll do another session later in the day and that's it. So, but the dog works as long as the dog can work and the longer I have him, the longer he can because he builds up stamina and resilience and he can do more. Yeah. Um, obviously, what you do is a more targeted, narrow application, specific session. It's a, it's different from like what we do in service dogs and board and, board and train stuff where we have right. time. Um, but he, there's one other thing I think that's um, maybe also interesting in this context. This is something I discussed with um, my mentor and friend Ivan at some point, training course I've taken. I think I mentioned it in one of the calls that we had is just because you don't see progress in a moment in a session with a dog doesn't mean there isn't any or the dog isn't learning anything just because it's not visual or visible in that moment doesn't mean that there's no learning taking place there is learning taking place it just takes a bit to get to what you actually want to see um but repetition and things like that the same that you may not see like this is dog you may not see the progress in the first round or after five minutes or ten minutes the dog gets too tired but that was learning taking place. He may need a little bit more, but it's not that it was worthless. It's just not visible to us just yet. It's just important to realize the dog's learning something. Um, we may not have gotten to the end stage of the lesson yet. We may have to revisit it, but it's not that it was worthless. It is never worthless. Well, in our case, because most people are used to seeing their dogs do backflips and go through all this nonsense, yeah. and avoid an obvious rattlesnake on a sidewalk when mm. they're looking at our course they're thinking are these guys ripping me off 
you know, because if you don't know what you're looking for, the exact yeah. way that the dog's going to receive, you don't know that your dog's learning. You have no idea. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, we had a guy in San Clemente, he was walking by and he said, all right, I'll try it. So we mm -hmm. went through the course and you could tell he's sitting there thinking he got ripped off. He goes yeah. out down the path there and there's a lot of rattlesnakes out there. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, he says his dog was kind of running through the weeds, jumped up about 10 feet or something. And he went over and looked and couldn't believe there was a rattlesnake there. He told yeah. us that story in front of the dog park with everyone lif uh, listening. That's wow, is that a profitable clinic? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was good. <laughs> but, that, but I think what you touched on is, is like the, this is the problem we have with like the social media culture now, right? Everything has to be flashy. Everything has to look extreme or like super cool. Or, and there's like this great quote from Michael Ellis on dog training that I love. And it's, it's just, it's this, good dog training is undramatic. And it doesn't look that flashy all the time. It doesn't look all that exciting. Good training is often not that thrilling to watch. The outcome will be thrilling to watch, but the process may not always be thrilling to watch. It's not a dramatic event to teach a dog to not attack other dogs. If it's a dramatic event, you're doing the wrong thing. It doesn't have to be a dramatic event to learn to live the rattlesnake along with backflips. That's not a good lesson. That would no. make a video for Instagram, but it wouldn't be good for the dog. Right. So that's the um, yeah, social media. No, and <clears throat> so to most people, you know, the other courses, you know, they have the big rattlesnake and they have the sound and they have a scent station that's utterly worthless. Um, and then they recall and, you know, it looks exciting. Ours is kind of boring. The dog, you know, you see the big snake in the beginning. That's exciting to the people. But what about all the scent stations? And the <laughs> truth is, those sense stations are the most important part. Yeah. And yeah, they're not dramatic. They're not flashy. You yeah. know, they're piles of dirt, basically. But it's the most crucial element, you yeah. know, because the dog will never pass the final station with that baby if it doesn't get those. Yeah. So, you know, the big snake, that's great. Well, I could teach anything to avoid that. <laughs> well, except myself, apparently. <laughs> yeah, you love snakes. You're, yeah. Uh... Uh, we, we, we could not share a house. Uh, I, I'm not, uh, <laughs> I, I don't yeah. have any for your favorite creature, so I'm not, a, I'm not a snake person at all. But I know they're your thing. That is perfect. Yeah, if you looked around my house right now, you probably wouldn't want to be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, uh, you told me. <laughs> I probably wouldn't want to sleep there. No. <laughs> you, you <laughs> not a fan of snakes. But that's what we have here. We need people who are fans of snakes and can teach us all about them and help our dogs avoid them. So um, anything else you would like to add? Oh, I'll just check us out, animaliaherp.com. Uh, there's lots of articles on there that you can read through. Um, especially if you're going to come to one of our clinics, we encourage people so that they know what they're looking at. <laughs> you know, it's just like you pointed out, it's not dramatic or anything, but it's important. And the people that actually read the articles, when they're watching, they, they'll see it. And they'll say, yeah, yeah, I see that. Yeah. yeah. Great. Awesome. Yeah, so as I said, we have three articles from Carl on our website, uh, uh, sponsored posts. No sponsored. They're like, uh, written, written by Carl. And uh, the link to Anomalia Hypertophona is on the bottom or in these articles. It will also be at the bottom of this podcast. And it's also regularly in our newsletter. It was just in the last one. Um, probably putting it in the next one because we're still in the like beginning stages. Do you have clinics all across the state? I know you're also branching out into, was it Texas or Arizona? It's Texas. Right? Yeah, well, we do Texas, we do California, we do Baja, California. Um, yep. I'm wanting to get over to the East Coast into Georgia mm -hmm. um, and start doing it there, maybe South Florida as well. Um, you know, because um, <clears throat> what I find is that most people that do this, Quite frankly, they do it wrong. So mm -hmm. when people start using us, then we start getting all the recommendations. And because of the name, Animalia Herpetofauna, what most people tell me is, yeah, my friend said, find the one, the website that you can't pronounce. That's the one to use. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, that, that, that'll do it. Right? So um, 
when you do these clinics, how do you find the locations and properties? Can people apply? Hey, I got this huge thing and we got a bunch of neighbors here. Did oh, yeah, own- we we get or- that a lot. Um, mm-hmm. We just got one for that we're going to be doing for uh, Hollywood Hills. Um, they're gun, uh, dog and gun club. And so um, they have this property out there. Um, I also, if I need a new area, I'll go find a trailhead or a park or something. Mm-hmm. And we just set them up. And so, right. But we've now we're at the point where we get so many calls for people wanting to do clinics. I haven't had to look for a place to put one in a couple of years because of it. Cause now we just, I mean, I had two calls already this week, the one for Hollywood Hills and another one for Chino area. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, we just keep getting calls. Hey, can you do one down here? Can you do one there? Well, where can we put it? Yeah. Oh, we'll use my yard. Okay. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I think the last clinic I was at was, uh, was your son. Uh, do you have two sons or you have one son and was a friend or was it, uh, yeah, I forgot. Uh, probably oh, Zach son. and Randy or something. Yeah, Zach, Zach was there. Yeah. So Zach and Randy. So it wasn't even you last time. So your son's doing the same thing. So it's really um Well, my out. son helped me start it. Yeah, yeah, I remember. It's great. Yeah, well, he he learned how to do dog training mm-hmm. from a dog trainer. He was doing obedience training. So, And he's worked with snakes his whole life, obviously. Look at that. Yeah. So, I mean, for him, it's natural. Yeah, that's awesome. Congratulations on the business growth. It's, uh, it's going well. Good to yeah, see it you. is actually. Yeah, good to hear. You deserve it. You're doing excellent work. Oh, okay. I appreciate that. Oh, yeah, definitely. No, you, you deserve it. Absolutely. Your, your training, for rattlesnake training, is the best I've seen. I've seen a whole bunch. So I send everybody your way. That's why I did this interview. That's why I reached out to you to do it. Because oh, I, yeah. I, I know what you're doing works. That's, that's the key thing. Okay, cool. You have anything else to add, or are you? No, that's it? about it. We okay, covered absolutely. quite a bit. <laughs> it is. Yes, we did, but not. I don't even know how long we talked, but uh, excellent. So wonderful. Uh, thank you very much for joining me, and uh, this was super informative um, for everybody who's listening. Great information on rattlesnake, rattlesnake avoidance training, and the links on how to schedule a training for your dog will be in the show notes. Um, and Carl's website as well, and check out his articles. There's lots of good stuff to read about rattlesnakes and poison and venom and everything you need to know to keep yourself and your dog safe. See you again next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.